It's lovely to see you. Um, I'm so excited to be, I'm so excited we're here. I'm excited that Lawrence is joining us. Hello, Lawrence. What a delight to have you. Um, in a moment, Bo will, maybe Bo will, will kick us off with the this, this, this series of introductions that we, that we like to do. And Bo will introduce me and I'll introduce Lawrence. And then um, I have some questions for Lawrence as well and then we can culminate our day with questions that you all have about the scenic design process and Lawrence's work in particular. Sound good? All right, Bo, do you awesome. want to take us away? Yeah, so my name is Bo Kelly. I work in the University Advancement Office. Thank you all for being such great supporters of TheaterWorks. We're excited to have you all today. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, when Lawrence is presenting, uh, the Zoom etiquette is to, to mute your cameras so that there's no background noise um, or mute your mic. Um, and then if you have questions, you can either put it in the chat or there actually is a raised hand function at the bottom of your screen um, under reactions. Um, and then on the chat function, that's also one of those, or you can type questions into the chat. So just with the number of folks, that makes it a little bit easier. Um, but once again, thank you for joining. And then to introduce Caitlin, um, Kayla Lones joined UCCS in August 2018 after completing her Master of Fine Arts degree in theater directing at Northwestern University. She received her bachelor's degree from Georgetown University major in international politics um, before pursuing her MFA at Northwestern. And we are so lucky to have her. So welcome. Thanks, Bo. Um, I'm excited to see you all. Hello, Bert. Hello, Dick and Sandra. Hello, Jordan. Hello, Todd. Nice to see you on a virtual events. Shocking. Hi, John. Hi, Gina. Hi, Ed. Hello, Al and David and Carol. And of course, hello, Lawrence. So I'm going to um, provoke an emotional reaction in Lawrence by reading Lawrence's bio in front of him. And then Lawrence can feel however Lawrence feels. I know how I feel when Bo, when Bo reads mine. Um, so Lawrence Moten is a New York City-based designer for plays, musicals, live events, and installations. His design work, often new plays and world's premieres, has been seen at many places around New York City. Regionally, his work has been seen at California Shakespeare Theater, American Conservatory Theater, the Old Globe, the Repertory Theater of St. Louis, Playmakers Repertory Company, Williamstown Theater Festival, Everyman Theater, Capitol Repertory Theater, Merrimack Repertory Theater, Theater Works at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, Children's Theater Company, Company One, and then theater departments at Dartmouth and Princeton. Y'all, if you don't know, this is a very impressive list of regional theater at which Lawrence's work has been seen. Um, as well, Lawrence, oh, personal information about Lawrence that I didn't know before reading his bio was that he was raised in Seattle, Washington and San Antonio, Texas, gained an appreciation for design art and music at a young age. He earned his BFA in theatrical production arts and design from Ithaca College currently lives in Brooklyn and freelances across the country, even during this moment of pandemic. And so we'll have some questions for Lawrence about what it's like to be a scenic designer in a pandemic as well. Um, but Lawrence, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, currently zooming in from, from the unceded lands of the Monsilanape people, what is commonly known in colonizer terms as Flatbush Brooklyn. So excited to be here with you all. I love that. Thank you, Lawrence, for that reminder. And if you have, if you're wondering which productions at TheaterWorks you saw Lawrence's work on, that would be um, Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry, American Prom by Idris Goodwin, and then also Arcadia by Tom Stoppard. So like a really lovely breadth of different work just encapsulated within those three shows at TheaterWorks as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Lawrence, can we start with sort of your origin story as a theater artist? How did you come to be a person of the theater? Oh God, um, sure. So uh, to know that is to know that like I was raised as a military brat. My father was in the Navy. We were stationed in Georgia when I was a wee young man. And then Seattle was where we spent 10 years. And when my, my father retired, he was medically retired, he's kind of acting in plays and doing things in school. And I had a, um, 
the small private school I went to had a lovely small theater program. And then my parents split as is many, the things that happen with many families. And my mom and I went to Texas, which is where she's from. Um, and I had a really amazing theater teacher my freshman year. My mom knowing that I at like 13 years old was going through massive culture shock and, and a huge rift in the family was a, was a really smart, nurturing mother to know that like you love theater I want you taking a theater class and so I met my theater teacher his name was Scott Schumann who uh taught my theater one class and he's like hey you should take my technical theater class at the time in Texas uh there was like a new law I don't know if it's still on the books that like for every dollar you spend on sports you have to spend a dollar in the arts as far as like how funding happened right so like my school is in the middle of football country in San Antonio, Texas. They just spent something like seven or eight million dollars on a new stadium. I think it eventually ballooned to something like 10 or 11. And so they were they spent essentially the same amount of money on a performing arts center um, for my high school. So I had a 40 foot wide proscenium stage with a full fly house with a black box, you know, adjustable theater. And I had access to arts education in high school that was so paramount to my development as an artist. And I fell in love with the theater. I think I was 15 years old when I kind of um, turned to Scott. I was like, so I wanna do this. I wanna, I wanna do this forever. How do I get ready for it? How do I get ready for college? How do I get ready for the thing? And so Scott really like, he started to train me and kind of um, hone my skills as a theater practitioner, even at that age, to the point where like my high school hired me to help run the building that we were working at. So like as uh, events would come through and they needed lighting technicians or board ops or lighting designers for those like kind of one-off events, I was that person and, and, and making money for this thing that I was doing. So I just fell in love with the theater at 15 and I've been pursuing it ever since. Went to college for it, moved straight to New York City after undergrad and haven't looked back since. That's my, that's my like two minute, I don't know, five minute thing on my origin story. Your concision is admirable, Lawrence. And I feel like this will come back later when we discuss the design process and how you decide what to slice away. Like I wanna celebrate uh, that precision and language. I wanna pick up on, I feel like there are a bunch of things I wanna pick up. Something that I'm interested in because you said that you, during high school, you were working, you know, in lighting design, in 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 different forms of theatrical technical design, and I know that you yourself, well, a lot of your work has been in um, scenic design. I know that you also have costume design work as well, and so I'm interested in um, how it is that of all of the different ways of theatrical storytelling, that scenic design was the one that lifted up for you. Sure. Um... So I was a kid that was always uh, reading books. Like my mom, we could not walk into a Barnes and Noble or a Borders bookstore and my mom was spending less than $50, typically close to 100. I just like consumed books. I consumed literature at a wildly active imagination as a child. And when I read texts, I see spaces, right? Like I think in terms of architecture and sculpture and that's the way that my brain has always worked. I was always the kid who had Legos and was just like building worlds. And so architecture was always my way in. I love architecture, I love buildings, I love the kind of heartbeat of how someone can take these non-living or very cold, hard things and, and create life with them and create storytelling and movement within what is a very static idea traditionally. And so scenery was always my forefront. I think like I growing up had been, we renovated houses growing up and it was, a, I was always tactilely learning paint walls, help my, my parents with, with, with work around the house. And so kind of that way into design was the way that scenery always manifested itself in me. When I went to college, I was a scenic and lighting designer. Mm -hmm. And lighting is so ephemeral. Lighting is so ephemeral in the way that you have to think about it and the way that you have to talk about it with others that like my brain couldn't wrap around that at the time. And costumes was so much more tactile in the way that we, we talk about the human form and how we talk about character and, and, and place, that that made so much more sense to me. And so I kind of shifted that to be my secondary. So that was, scenery was always the first one. And then mm. and costume design became a second love of mine. And I actually credit my costume design class with the way that I became a true designer and the way that I think about mm. like more than my set design class, more than any of the other craft or design classes I took, it was my costume designer in undergrad who 
got me to look at a text and analyze a text to be able to then speak to the choices I was making visually as a designer. And that filtered into all other aspects of my design work. I love that, yeah. So let's talk a little, because you've, had, you've opened the invitation to talk about like what happens when you first encounter a theatrical text, whether, you know, what, what happens for you when you first encounter a theatrical text? How do you, what is your in now that you are a scenic designer and how, you, how do you begin to think about that world? So the first thing uh, I read a text, I don't read it for the design. I just read it to enjoy it, right? Like I, and even in a first conversation with a director, I'm not often talking about design. I'm asking questions of the text. I'm asking what excites me about the text, what confuses me about the text, what's really difficult, what do I find really beautiful, what do I find really hard, why this text now? Like often the question, because design and art is political and a reaction to now always is why now? Why are we doing this text? Why are we telling this story now? And what is it about now that makes this story resonate with us as artists and will make it resonate with, with audiences? So I'm kind of always reading for that. And, and, and then I start to ask how, right? And then I start to ask how it's shaped. And I think the question I always ask myself and the question I always ask a director is how does the play move, which is uh, specifically vague, right? It is a specifically vague question that I ask and I know that when I ask it because I think I'm trying to get a director or a creative collaborative storyteller to not think about the nuts and bolts of a play. I don't want a director to say, well, I want a chair here and a platform here and a wall here. I want them to say, well, the, the play feels cyclical or the play feels like a vortex or it feels like a void and that the characters should feel lost in space or that they should feel knocking against each other. Like those are the things that I start to ask in the collaborative storytelling of like what it is about a play. And then I start to find those words. What are the motifs? What are the themes that a playwright is repeating and how do those affect how I'm thinking. And then I just, I go and I search for images. And I think like in the age of, of COVID and in the age of a pandemic, here we are, I'm gonna use Google image search and I'm gonna use a bunch of different things that like allow me to stay in the safety of my home. Um, in the before times, it would be going to the bookstore. And I think I, I've made it a, a mission to at least buy one new art book with each project. So that way I'm, I'm kind of constantly expanding my visual library. I've made it a new thing of mine to make sure that my research is at least 50% artists of color um, so that I'm, I'm, I'm allowing the global majority of the population to be reflected in the art that I'm, I'm looking at and letting that global majority affect my work and my visions. Um, and so it's about casting that wide net and then, and then winnowing from there and always seeing how images whether they speak directly to a play, like if it's a kitchen room sink, kitchen sink drama, right? I'm gonna find plenty of things that are like an apartment or a kitchen sink or whatever that space is, but I'm also trying to find an emotional container. I'm trying to find images, artwork, things that speak to the overarching emotion of a piece beyond the nuts and bolts, beyond the nitty gritty of like, we need that chair. What's that chair supposed to look like? We need that table. What's that table supposed to look like? I wanna know how we want an audience to feel when they enter and leave the space. And so that's kind of the overarching goal for me as a designer is to kind of imbue the physical world with that same emotional quality so that we're always speaking to that same emotional goal as storytellers, the audience can feel that not only in the performance of the actors, but in every choice that we've made as a collaborative team. Yeah. I love that. So I'm thinking about, and, and maybe it would, and I can also like, I have your website and we can, we can look at some pictures, you know, so we sure. can do it that way. But I'm interested in, because your work, um, sometimes, for example, those of you at Theater Works who saw Raisin in the Sun, Raisin in the Sun is, it was a, was a space that I would think of as very naturalistic. And, and then those of you who saw Arcadia, Arcadia was a space that was in many ways, at the other side of the spectrum, a relatively uh, a non naturalistic, wildly, ab wildly abstracted space. Thank you for um, thank you for scenic designer Mad Lives Lawrence. And then, like American Prom, sort of falls in the middle, where it has the appearance of a naturalistic space, and then 
through the use of the light, through the use of light becomes also a sort of vivid abstracted space. And I, I feel, I feel almost like I should, like I, cause we can show pictures of the audience. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can recall in your head that the scenic design for those three shows, getting a thumbs up from David such that we know what we're, what we're talking about. And so I'm interested in how, um, in sort of you exploring two sides of that, how do you bring that sense of emotion and that sense of feeling to a space that um, over the course of your process with the director, you decide that that space wants to be more naturalistic, but like still has that emotional impact. And how do you think of that emotion in response to realism? And then maybe I'll ask you a different question about, about what happens when you're designing abstract, when the space sure. leans more towards abstraction. I think hyper-realism always has a point of view. Mm -hmm. There's something we're always trying to say with hyper-realism. And I think, uh, I always, I, so I, I, I will often say this, it's always coming back to the text. And I think I'm always looking for what the text is asking of us as designers and storytellers. So in, in the sense of, of Raisin in the Sun, what Lorraine Hansberry has given us is that we're trying to really peel back and get a glimpse of what the struggle of your lower middle class African-American family was in Chicago at the time. And so there is something that asks for us to be able to see and experience that emotional struggle of like, we have enough money to get by, but not enough to be comfortable. And what is it to say that the success or failure and the, the economic success or economic death of a family is dependent on the physical death of a patriarch, right? What does that mean? And that's a really hard thing. So I think there's something about that when, when talking with, um, with the director that was so evident to us that like it was about creating a space that felt uh, claustrophobic, that felt dark, that felt like it was a place of growth and tension and that we could get life beyond it. And more, and, and more importantly, from like, a, from like a storytelling perspective, I think about like, how do we make sure we understand that, that we as the audience are interlopers, that we are, we are peeling back a layer and just watching a story play out in front of us that like is wildly naturalistic, um, which lends itself to an air of realism, which lends itself to an air of drabness in the set and in the, the atmosphere of it that makes you feel like, you know, they miss one bill and like everything's gonna fall apart. And there's something about that emotional landscape that has to be um, communicated. And so it was a lot of like finding what these spaces felt like architecturally. What are the doors? What are the windows? What are those ideas of like shared common spaces where the bathroom isn't in your apartment, it's down the hall and it's a shared space. And what did those, what did those Chicago apartments look like? But then beyond that, what is the age Right, no, no, no self-respecting black family lets a, a space get dirty, but what is the age of like, we've just been living here for so long that is a conglomeration of generational artifacts, things that are good, things that are bad, things that we've made do, what did we find out? Like, there's an element of that beyond the like, we scrub the walls, but like the walls haven't been repainted or re-wallpapered in 15 years. So what's that amount of age that comes in? So there's a lot of like, working to make a fate a space feel lived in without feeling decrepit and i think that was a fine line to draw in raisin in the sun uh and can go a lot of different ways with this show but i think it was that it was allowing that like we're gonna have people of varying skin tones on stage and luckily kathy perkins the lighting designer was also like has been lighting skin like dark skin and and and, and bodies of color for years so how do we work with a palette that allows them to pop forward and allows them to to really be the thing that kathy can can carve out um there was a lot of our conversation with with this space and the realism of it and where we could see realism and where we were allowed to be in the storytelling of, of what that space was. Did that answer the question, Caitlin? I think it did. Okay. I, I and it great. was and it was really lovely because I'm also thinking about how um 
one of the particular moments of storytelling through through design that I remember in Raisin in the Sun was the moment in which the the painting of the foot yes you did the gesture we did the gesture mm -hmm. um to re to scroll up a little bit and I you know we had um the patriarchs you all placed the patriarchs image up center and then that moment in the play when the image is when the painting is taken off of the wall the photograph rather is taken off of the wall and behind it you can see that the lack of age right because it hadn't because that painting it or that photograph had been up for so long when that thing came off you saw that square of, of, of light cut, surrounded by darkness in the aging which was like really important that we talk about the permanency of the patriarch in this family and that like right Walt, like there was just a, a how does one find agency when that patriarch is always hanging over you is another like kind of sub story in this in this play and it's a it's a beautiful harsh reality right where like you aren't allowed your agency because your father whether present or not doesn't allow you to move forward and your mother like what are those things and then the, that memory becoming something that was cherished and comes with them rather than being something that hangs over them and looms over them in such a way was something that like whether or not we realized it was what we were saying in the time of what that that photograph the weight of that photograph and the age around that photograph mm -hmm. showed us yeah it was really beautiful and i mm, i'm interested too in how and how you begin to then think about within specifically a naturalistic space and then we can also talk about an abstracted space how you then begin to think about how the human beings will will move within the space and whether you view that as part of your role as a designer whether you view that as a collaborative relationship with the director or just just the directors you know problem to solve once you've given them how do you think about how people will inhabit this space and move within it i think about it intricately i think i say this so many times as a young designer we will say well that's a that's a problem for the director Right, that's a problem for the, or that's something that I can't make a decision as as a designer, and I think that that's inherently false. I think, especially as a scenic designer, I am a director. I am thinking about and shaping the ways in which people are going to move in the space, and if we, as a designer and director, aren't having those collaborations and those conversations from jump, from the very beginning, then our vocabulary is inherently going to be off, and so the only way for in my opinion, a design to be successful is to ask and say, where do you want this moment to happen? Let's talk about the beats. Are these people so close together that in order to walk past them and they feel like they have to shimmy or is there so much space that it feels like they can't anchor to each other? And that kind of give and take and, and creation, you know, uh, collapsing or expanding of space is inherently a, a direction or a part of the directing that I know is my responsibility. Often by the time with a lot of my collaborators and the collaborators who I've got three and four shows with, um, by that point in tech, I'm helping stage. I'm not, I'm not talking about the design. I'll have directors literally be like, how do I stage this scene? And, and so I have to remove that part of my brain and be like, well, in the concepts of storytelling and what we've talked about in blocking and what you've been doing in blocking. So I'm still paying attention to that. I'm still paying attention to that storytelling. And I'm paying attention to it from the beginning, from the moment I'm like starting to analyze a text, movement of actors and spaces. It's not just about the pretty picture. It's not just about creating the, the good thing to look at. It's about making sure that what I do supports the storytelling on stage. And if I haven't done that, if that tension or if that need for the actors to be able to inhabit a space correctly and feel that that is a natural way for them to inhabit space and tell that story. If I haven't done that in my job, then I failed in my job as a designer. And so, yeah, every scenic designer is a director in some way, shape or form. Directing can be at the end of the day, completely silent. It's about bodies and space. So it, at the, you know what I mean? It, it, tension is, is about the, the separation of bodies and space and figuring that out in a set is, in, is intrinsic to my design philosophy. I love that. And do you think about that differently? I won't shout out Arcadia in this case, even though folks here have seen it, because while it was an abstracted set, you know, 
the primary physical relationship in space was with that very realistic, very large table. Mm -hmm. um, is there another design that you've worked on that was much more abstracted where as a designer, you, you and the director were in collaboration about needing to, you know, it, the, yeah. Human relationships were not dictated by a couch and a coffee table, but were rather storyboarded by you or designed by you in the beginning of the process. Yeah, um, it would be Native Son with Colette Robert at Playmakers Rep. Um, so that show was written by Nambi Kelly, uh, who directed Raisin in the Sun. And Raisin in the Sun was our first interaction together, but then I got to direct one of her, the first regional productions of this play, which was her retelling of Native Son. Um, the book and it has a, a previous iteration for stage and this is a this is a new interpretation of the staging and so in this play from jump we're talking about um, this character bigger and his psychosis right and he kind of splits his character she splits his character into two and in that there's bigger and then his his kind of mental state black rat but again young black man stuck in a situation in America in which, or in the, in the United States, let's acknowledge that there are two different continents that are America, uh, that are that is stuck in the States um, and can't, has no agency, right? He's stuck in a world in which his dreams and desires as a young African-American man are stifled. Uh, and so we want, he wanted to be a pilot, talks about it a lot in the, play, in the play, they fly so high, those pilots can go anywhere. So it became wildly important to us to kind of surround him in the detritus and in the, the, the space that was an airplane hangar to say, if you're never gonna be able to fly, you're never gonna be able to be a pilot. How do we tell a story of the failed American dream for a young black man that surrounds him in the dream so we can watch it all break apart around him? And so we played a lot with the abstraction of level and the abstraction of space and the abstraction. So it's a you know hugely degraded American flag. It's a wildly abstracted uh, airplane hangar. There's a lot of detritus of like militaristic and um, kind of, of pragmatic tools for a warehouse around him that place us in time. And then it took us eight hours. I think it was it was two three hour sessions on like zoom or zoom and 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 one two hour session of myself the director and the lighting designer looking at my ground plans and literally stepping through because in 90 minutes there are 36 scenes it's something like a lighting change every 72 seconds i think is what reza our lighting designer said like it's a wild play it I mean, some some scenes are two two lines long, but we have to set up that look and make that statement and then move on. And so it was about us stepping through page by page by page by page and saying, given the canvas we've made, how does Reza and how does Colette, the director, move bodies in space to tell the story? And and what are we using? So all of a sudden, like, okay, well, in the way that I've placed it, all of a sudden we can put a car here and they can sit at this trunk. And if we do that with like a, I don't know if it's in this, Caitlin, if you scroll down, there might be a moment where we see them in the car and it's actually like two headlights that are shining through the translucent back. No, that'll be the last of it. Um, and it was just wildly abstract, but we used different locations on stage and different lighting looks. And it took us a long time of being very specific about where things were and how people moved. and without those ground plans, without that scene by scene work, which took us eight to 10 hours before Colette got into rehearsal, she's like, I wouldn't have known how to stage the show. I don't know how I would have staged that show in three weeks if we hadn't done that work beforehand so that I knew what our framework was and I could make alterations within it, but we knew that the story worked from a spacing perspective because we'd spent that time. But that this is a nowhere space other than airplane hangar or hangar it's a nowhere space there's nothing specific about it but we go to a store and we go to a house and we go to an apartment and we go to a we're in a taxi car and we're in a chauffeur car and we're on top of a building and we're in an abandoned um we're in two abandoned apartment buildings throughout the course of the place so there's a lot of things that happen throughout this show and it was very clear to us from the beginning like realism doesn't serve the play hyper-realism doesn't sit, like it doesn't make sense for the motor and speed at which Nambi is telling the story for us to like move something on and move something off and move something on and move something off. So how do we 
quickly get from moment to moment to moment to moment, knowing that our actors are telling us where, and we have to differentiate within design in an abstract way to support that. I love that. So I have two more, I have, to, I have two more questions for you. And then I'm excited to hear what other, what questions other folks have. And so my one question is, uh, one of the things that you shout out that you're specifically excited about and that you also did here at Theater Works is new plays. And what are the specific, um, what are the, the challenges and excitements and like specific moments of difficulty or squishiness that happen when you're designing for a text that's not yet finished <laughs> before you go into the design process and how do you have to think about that differently and i'll maybe i'll, I'll do some screen share of american prom just just for fun so we can bring I, that back into people's brains i love the new play process i mean i love it i love working with a living playwright because i think it allows us to grapple with and struggle with and explore themes that feel so very relevant to now um which is the world that I move through. I, I don't, not to say that classics aren't classics, but I struggle with the term classic because the term classic feels like gatekeeping to an entire generation of voices that then we don't place value on. And I think new playwrights and new, new plays are giving voice to a generation of, of, of voices that excite me. I love the idea of being able to sit with a playwright and ask them outright, what did you mean by this? Or what are you trying to get at with this? Or what this moment is confusing to me. And I don't necessarily say that in a bad way, but I want to talk to you about it so that I can get to it correctly. Or how do I serve what you're trying to say? And I think that living, I don't get to have that conversation with Shakespeare. I don't get to have that conversation with Ibsen. I don't get to have that conversation with, and that conversation has kind of been um, ground into us from an, an iconic place of like exploration that the newness of new plays and the vibrancy of new voices is something that I find so important. And so I get so passionate about. And so I think there's something about that. And I think the, the, the difficulties that, yeah, at a certain point, like new pages, new things. I'm doing a play right now that was put on pause in the pandemic. It's a new play. I, the theater was like, okay, we're gonna pause the play just finished designing the show and then like it'll be quote unquote in the can and when we're ready to produce it we can start building and producing the play and I was like okay here's the drawings and here's the pain elevations and here's all of those things but also putting into the space that the playwright has told me that one of the characters in this current draft isn't going to exist in the next draft so like the play is going to change and I reserve the right to make changes to the design because that's the point we're here to support the text so I think those changes are both hard and exciting. Um, I think you always have to design a little more abstractly. I think, I think new plays excite me because they kind of force abstraction because it's to say, I need to create a space that can do many things and can shift and, and adapt nimbly with the changes in the text. And how do I create a space that does that? Conversely, if it's a hyper-realist realist, play that like, okay, we're going to try it. And like, the goal isn't to get it right the first time. And I think like, as an artist, I've been working to remove the idea of right or correct from my vocabulary that like, we get as far as we get in the storytelling process and then opening night happens. So like, give us another three weeks or another three months on American Prom and the set probably would have looked wildly different in a hundred different ways that I can't even imagine. But this is what felt like the necessary springboard, knowing that like someone else is gonna pick up the baton and run with it in a new production. But like, how do I give this new text and these performers that are exploring and encountering a brand new shifting text, the support necessary to tell this story to the best of all of our abilities and then go forward from there. That's what I love about new plays and that's the difficulty and joy of new plays. Yeah, how can you give it enough to hold it and be the boat that carries it forward to that next port where it's going to be? It's not about, yeah. you know, and it's not about the self-servingness of like, I want to be the person that moves with a play as it moves forward. I mean, like that's the economic success of a thing, but I think it's more about um, serving the play. 
and serving the play in the best way possible so that other people can get excited about it so that that artist gets a voice to move forward and that that mm -hmm. show gets a voice to move on and it gets another try. It gets an, I mean, like Idris Goodwin, who did American Prom, that's, that was my third Mm -hmm. uh, foray with Idris. I did a, I was an associate for a world premiere of his. I've designed two world premieres of his. One of those shows has been wildly popular across the United States, Hype Man. Um, and, and we're rehashing it now with ART. We're in the editing phase of the show that I designed three years ago. Same cast, same director, but now we're filming it. And so like, there's something about that new play process that gets really exciting when you get to come back to a text after so many years away and be like, oh, how did we do this? And what was right? And what can we do better? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah for those of you who aren't uh as enmeshed in the world of theater one of the big like conversations and challenges even in the before times before, around new plays was how much um how much focus was often placed on a first production in terms of whether or not that play would have a future life so sometimes like a few a, a first production that did not support the play in the way that the play needed to be supported could sometimes be a determinant of whether or not anyone would ever touch that work again. And I think that there's been a lot of conversation in the theater about how to change that dynamic and view it as a process and let the second and the third productions of a play also, um, you know, hold and allow and allow things to move on. But there, there definitely is a dynamic of that, of that first production, even as it's a production of process also and the having some, it, and the right? reviews of it, that weird thing about theater that, um, productions are ephemeral and reviews are everlasting. <laughs> right. Tricky, but you, at the very end, you were beginning to talk about theater for film, which was the, which was my next question for you because you have been designing works that are pieces of theater and also are um, experience, productions that are experienced entirely through streaming. Yes. So what has that process been like and how have you think, thought differently and the same about that work, given that it's still a piece of theater, but it's, it's shared in a totally different medium? Right, I think it's happened three different ways with three, three different productions. I'm going into my fourth, fifth and sixth productions now. So I've done it three times. Um, I did Hire You Single at Woolly Mammoth, which was kind of the first one, um, in which case the framing, the framing of the process, I think, is wildly important, in which case we said over and over and over again, we are attempting to capture a theatrical piece on film. So we will be using theatrical vocabulary and then using the advantage of the tools of film to capture this piece and how do we start to navigate that. And so at the end of the day, we were still very much so thinking about it as a theatrical piece because it was gonna have a dual component and it still will have a dual component. Like we're gonna capture it and stream it now. And then when it is safe to do so, this whole set has been saved and is like sitting in a storage container somewhere that's gonna come back out again. And Ryan's gonna go back to DC, we'll retech it and it will have a live performance run of three weeks or whatever it is. So you will be able to have this live version of it. And I think, in that sense, it was very specific that we frame it and we make sure that we were we were hitting two tick marks. One, that we're creating a live theater production that did not need to be redesigned. And two, that we were integrating with a film company in such a way that understood our goals of capturing a live theater performance and putting it on film, that we weren't doing a tentpole film, right? We weren't doing Chicago, we weren't doing Hairspray, we weren't doing The Prom that just came out to Netflix. We were doing some version of uh, Hamilton on Disney Plus, or we were doing um, what the Constitution means to me on Amazon Prime or Passover on Amazon Prime, like those ideas where we are capturing what is a live performance and how do we use the vocabulary and benefits of film to bring that liveness into our homes in a safe way. And so it was about that. It's about figuring out what colors work well on film, what sheens work well on film. It gets very technical because what the human eye sees versus what the camera sees is wildly different. And there are a hundred different cameras that see a hundred different things. And to be able to figure that out uh, is hard. Um, this had an added benefit or an added difficulty for me it was I was also the costume designer. So what costumes work well on film? We had a shirt that was really lovely and bright and poppy for Ryan, but it was red, green, blue, and white, which felt like white noise. And so every time the camera picked it up, it just blasted through the camera in a way that like, can't put that on it, right? 
and that these warmer tones of pinks and reds and creams on, on Ryan's skin worked better for him and allowed him to be seen in contrast with the cool blues of the set behind, which was creating what we talk about in the world of film, which is depth of field. That when Ryan is the focus and that, that, that there's a crisp focus on him, there's still visual interest behind him in terms of like, uh, if you go down more and you go to this last image, which is his toast, like, yeah, you see Ryan, he's perfectly in focus. He's nice and carved out with lighting and you can see him, but there's still a little bit of visual interest in the background. Right, that the soft focus of the camera is still going to catch that, which is a very different idea. It's also the question of the box, right? Like what the camera sees is what the camera sees, and I don't have to design everything else. Whereas, like as a theatrical designer, I design for what the human eye is going to see. I design for the totality of it all. Where like I can have raw plywood right here off screen if we were talking and this were the box you were looking at, but like the camera's never going to see that, so like I don't need to finish it. And so there's an element of that that gets really interesting. Um, in Hype Man, that was absolutely a tentpole film. We were making a we were making a filmed production of a theatrical text. In which case, like there are no soft goods, there is no audience, there is no anything. It's just film. And so it was about creating a fully realistic room, a fully realistic performance space. So it was about taking the themes and ideas from our 2018 production and re-envisioning them in a filmic nature, which was difficult and on a timeline that was very fast, which wasn't helpful. But um, the, at the, I just saw the, I watched the first cut on Saturday um, and had a meeting about our first cut yesterday, which was really exciting. So like, it's gonna be a really exciting thing when we get there. Um, but yeah, we're in the editing process now for that. And I love, I love that you're also that you say we about the editing process too. So like you are still part of that storytelling as, as you look at the edit as well. It depends on the company. I was not yeah. a part of the editing process with Wooly. I'm uh, the other pro production I've done is um, the Sound Inside Adam mm -hmm. Rapp play that was just on Broadway this past season uh, is was filmed at TheaterWorks Hartford. Uh, in Connecticut. And so uh, I did the set design for that. And I am currently not in the editing process for that. So Hype Man is the only one I've been in the edit. It just depends company to company yeah. and how inclusive or not inclusive they want that process to be. And I'm, I'm adaptable. I love that. Lawrence, thank you so much for, for answering all my questions. I have, I've taken so many notes about things that I want to think about further from what you've shared. I am interested in our folks who aren't me and whether you all have questions or responses and things that you're thinking about in response to what we've been sharing thus far. Al, I see your hand. You, you know me, Caitlin, I, and, and you anticipated some of the things I was gonna ask. First of all, I just have to say, for me, the experience of hearing all of the extraordinary care and detail that goes into the finished product that we theater goers get to enjoy um, just enriches this experience so much. And um, I, I, I wish we could engage more of our audience in learning about this because I think it's, it's just marvelous. I have a specific question about Arcadia. Um, I'm wondering how much of your choice with regard to the very minimal set was driven by, I'm assuming, the director's decision to stage it the way they did with the audience seated on opposite sides of the stage. Uh, that, was a, that was a communal choice between Caitlin and myself. It was. Oh. Hey, Lawrence, thank you for, for sharing that sword with me there. I appreciate uh, it. Well, I, I think like one of the first conversations we had that still sticks out of my mind is that one of the things we said is like, you, you can see an Arcadia set from a hundred miles away. An Arcadia set looks like an Arcadia set looks like an Arcadia set. And there was something about that futility of storytelling that did not interest us. And so we were excited to try and, and, and break out of that thinking. And so it was about not being an end stage. And if we weren't gonna be an end stage seating, what kind of seating were we gonna be in? How are we asking the audience to engage with the storytelling? which then led us to, to tennis court or alleyway seating, however you want to talk about it, which then was like, 
well, then we're going wildly abstract. And that kind of, that was the, the step of conversation. But I, I think that that was a, a joint decision mm -hmm. in the collaborative conversation that we had to be like, this is the thing that interests us as artists to say, why now? Yeah. Um, and I, I remember us too talking about when we first started to think about tennis court, that there's something about the dual narrative of Arcadia that people have, people are working with incomplete understandings of a story. And there was something about the fact that in tennis court, what I love about tennis court and frustrates other people to no end is that it is actually a slightly different experience from different sides. And that felt thematically connected. Wildly important. Yeah. Yeah. To Arcadia. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Dickinson. No, no, go ahead. No, you, uh, Al, if you have a follow-up, because I had just noted that Dick and Sandra unmuted, so I thought oh, they oh, might oh, have. I'm sorry, you know, just a follow-up question yeah. on this. Um, when you first read, and maybe you'd been familiar with Arcadia previously, Lawrence, but when you, when you first read it, did you have a vision? You know, again, it, it was a very challenging play. I read it with a play reading group that I belong to here. Um, and oh my gosh, it was so hard to understand and to talk about it. And I saw it at least twice, maybe three times when, when we staged it and never completely got my head around it. But I'm curious whether in the reading of it, it struck you right off the bat that because of the sort of complexity of the ideas and such that it necessitated this sort of simpler uh, approach to the staging of it. I, I don't know what a traditional Arcadia set might have looked like, but. Um, I mean, a, a, a quote unquote traditional Arcadia set is, you know, a, a, a Victorian era sitting room, couple of doors, high windows, light streaming through, and that like through costume and like quick set changes and prop changes, we're able to like flip back and forth between time periods, right? Like there's something about that that feels so kind of, um, for lack of a better word, iconic, right? And, and there's something about the uh, iconic nature of that that not rubs me the wrong way, but it feels like we get to sit down and not engage. And I think there's something about the engagement of abstraction that asks an audience to overlay their own emotional footprint on top of what I'm saying that asks for a greater amount of give and take, which is why I love live theater as opposed to film and television. There's something about all of us sitting in a room and communing together and that if I don't give you everything, then you give something as well to the storytelling and that creates a richer experience for all of us. Um, what struck me about that play was the incom incomplete ideas of communication that Caitlin was talking about and, the, and the, the time slip that we had to be so quick in one space, quick in another and it was almost like, back and forth. And there's something about that. And we explored a lot of mathematical themes in the research for this as to how math and, and um, mathematical equations kind of like lead on to, what was it, the key, what was the phrase, Caitlin? The heat death of the universe that we use, <laughs> right? And like what those kind of like spirals are of mathematical equations and how they can kind of spiral outward that led us to the simplicity of, of of line and the simplicity of geometry um, and allowing that to hold the reality of time and space and, and people that we were centering the individuals in what was an abstract timeless idea. Um, mm -hmm. Does that feel right? It, oh, to me, yes. I, I think that people would be surprised um, if we had another session on the Arcadia process, right? You would have seen more diagrams of heat exchange and yeah. sort of then you in our collaborative scenic design then you would have processed then you would have seen interiors of early 19th century homes yeah which is very different than I imagine other folks's process of designing for Arcadia would have been yeah, I, we, I explored a lot of like mathematical sculptural spaces and how spaces that were ge geometric influenced how people might move through space rather than what's crown molding and what's chair rail and what's baseboard and what wallpaper would we use? Like there was something about that that felt like it didn't serve the purpose of the text in, in the ways in which we wanted to explore it. 
I'm so intrigued because Dick and Sand, Dick and Sandra, uh, you you unmuted, and I know that Arcadia is a passion of yours. So, is your question about Arcadia? It doesn't have to be. It can be about whatever you want it to be. Well, mostly it's a compliment. I I thought set was marvelous. I mean, I first encountered it as just the text, and had pictured it the standard Versinian stage sort of setting. And then uh, to walk in and see four pillars which were just the edges of the space, but they were sometimes inside, sometimes outside or through the window or whatever. And as Lawrence said, my, my imagination had to fill, fill that in. Uh, so, I I thought that it was a marvelous combination with, especially with, with what the playwright was doing with, you know, never letting you sit down in the same place twice, and acquiring and forgetting and you know, uh, picking up and and losing stuff as you make your way through the play make your way through life. All that was very nice. The, I did not see fractals, but I certainly saw the second law of thermodynamics play itself out very nicely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's lovely. Does anyone else, we're at our we're at our last couple of minutes. Is, oh, I see Bert. This is great. I feel like the Zoom reach is like our new key clue go. in that someone wants to share. It's so good. Bert, Bert and Mary, hello. I just was wondering in the typical collaborative process, is it is it variable? Does does the director have a meeting with the scene and the you know co yeah. costume and and then you go your separate ways, you've read the play, and then you come back with design boards and their ideas, and then you say, no, 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 we want this. I mean, how does that typically work? It's variable, right? And I think like directors often head that process and, and I take my, my um, cues from them. I will say that like in the, in the before times, the industry would, like I'm often the first person hired, like the set designer is the first person hired. And sometimes it's like, well, we're talking to a costume designer, but we don't really know about sound and lighting. I've started to push back against that and say that like from the beginning, we want all voices in the room because I always describe scenery as a canvas that a lighting designer has to paint on top of. And if I haven't given them the right canvas, then it, they can't paint properly. And so it is like, we all talk about the play, what excites us, what doesn't, something that may excite the lighting designer that I hadn't thought about, all of a sudden I'm writing it down. I'm really like juiced about it. And so I'm gonna go explore that theme. So I want all those voices in the room and then we'll go away and we'll think about it and we'll come back together and we'll see what resonates and what doesn't. What I often say in a process is that the best idea in the room is the best idea in the room. And so if the sound designer has an idea about the set that everyone's excited about, great, we're putting it in this, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't, just because I'm the set designer, it doesn't mean that all ideas have to come from me. I'm going to give my thoughts on sound. I'm going to give my thoughts on lighting. I'm going to give my thoughts on costumes. And I expect that those designers are gonna give me those same thoughts because I want them, because we are better together than we are alone. And so I think that collaborative process to be as transparent and fluid as it can be only creates a better product in the end or a better storytelling effort in the end. So I, I want all those voices in the room as soon as possible. And I ask for that and I will often just call it. I think I have a phone call with a lighting designer tomorrow. Director's not involved, but just to be like, Hi, let's talk about the play. I want to hear your thoughts. What excites you? What doesn't excite you? How do we, you know, how do I set you up for success? Because if I haven't set up a lighting designer for success, then like none of us are going to look good. And that's a problem. So, you know, um, that's how it goes for me. I hope that answers the question. Oh, it does. I can tell you're certainly passionate about your work. It's great to see that too. Makes me more passionate, I guess, too. I love that. I feel like better together than we are apart is like the perfect place to sort of leave my heart for today anyway. I want to thank Lawrence so much for taking the time to just open up the process for us. And as Bert said, to share your passion. Really just delightful. We're really honored to have you. And thanks to all y'all 
Director Circle members for continuing to be wonderful supporters and make it all possible. Extra thanks to Todd Whitford for actually coming to a virtual event, which I will continue to haze him about slightly, but I'm very grateful um, to each and every one of you. Bo, is there anything that you would wanna make sure that we said? Uh, I think mark your calendars for April 8th, which is the next uh, iteration of this. And I, Lawrence, that was awesome. Very exciting. Yeah. And thanks everyone for joining. Yeah. So good. And right. I hope we'll be lucky enough to have you uh, return to the theater works. Uh, I don't know, Lor I mean, we would love it, but y'all, Lawrence is very fancy now. <laughs> I, I gather he is. I don't know how we got so lucky to have him in the first place, but. That's right. We, uh, we. If I could come back, you know I'd come back. My family's okay. not far from there either. Like, I have family about an hour outside of, of Colorado Springs. Oh, all right. Well, we'll try and woo you back, Lawrence. But also, if we were just the place that um, from which one of the many places that got to help you get to the next step, that's also an awesome thing to be too. So I feel good about all those things. Absolutely. All right, good people. Have a wonderful rest of your day. This Thank was you so much. Yes. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye, y'all. Thank you.